everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development. Um, we will be looking at S352, um, which is a technical corrections to the hazard pay bill that was passed in June. Um, we have with us um, our legislative counsel, Damian Leonard, who will walk us through those changes. Um, there was also an amendment that was placed in the bill um, on the Senate floor. Um, which has to deal with, which is dealing with uh, childcare and, and uh, moving some more dollars there. Um, that is not our purview. So we will not be looking at that today. We will only look at the technical corrections today. And um, if everything goes well, we will um, take a vote on that and hopefully move it forward so that it can be referred to the uh, Committee on Human Services and then ultimately to the Committee on Appropriations. So with that, Damien, if you would, uh, if you, do you, did you, were you able to get the bill? <laughs> so yes, we, um, I have an unofficial copy of the bill. Our, our as you can imagine, are uh, extremely backlogged right now. Yep. Um, and so they sent me over an unofficial copy that hasn't been proofread to make sure everything's right. But um, <laughs> I can share that. Amy, can you make it so I can share my screen? Yep, I just made you the co-host, and I did post the unofficial version to our web page and also send it to you guys by email. Okay, okay great. great. Thank, thank you, Amy. Sure. All right, so let me just pull that up, and there we go. Okay, can everybody see this? Yep. Great. So um, this is the the Senate, what the Senate passed here. So basically, they're going back into the original hazard pay law um, and making some amendments in there. Uh, the first is uh, an increase of two and a half million dollars. Um, that takes the amount appropriated from 28 to 30.5 million and this is the estimate to cover uh, the various technical changes here for groups that weren't counted in the original estimate. Um, the the next piece here is um, this is the first technical amendment. Um, so this is a homeless shelter. And then uh, originally when this was drafted, the assumption was that the hotels and motels that were housing the homeless would either come in under the definition of homeless shelter or a provider of uh, services and necessities to a vulnerable population. Um, the Agency of Human Services had a different reading uh, of the statute. Um, and so this is to clarify the intent that the hotels and motels that housed homeless populations because the homeless shelters were unable to provide uh, um, social distancing uh, for those populations uh, would be covered here. So this would make them retroactively eligible. Um, so that's your first expansion. Uh, the next is, uh, so it came to the attention of um, a number of different legislative members uh, that I, I heard from over the summer here that uh, both cleaning and janitorial services and food service um, are frequently contracted out um, by nursing homes and uh, other residential care facilities as well as, um, and this should have, been, should have been obvious having had a couple kids in recent years, um, hospitals there where the cafeteria is run by Aramark or another um, food service company like that. Um, and so this would provide for the cleaning and janitorial services um, that provide cleaning in locations that are open to the general public or regularly used by residents or patients of the covered employer. And then for food service providers um, who provide meals for residents or patients of the covered employer. Um, so the employees of those larger companies that are actually working at another covered employer to do this work um, become potentially eligible provided they meet the elevated risk. Uh, standards. Are there any questions on that? So one thing I want to note for the committee, um, 
and this has come to my attention through the Agency of Human Services. Um, and it, it really is a policy call for the legislature. And it, it came to our attention after this bill had already passed in the Senate, uh, is that there are also, um, I believe, three or four contract nursing companies that have been providing staff to healthcare facilities during the pandemic who have been asking about whether they would be covered. Under the current bill, they would not because the employer is not the UVM Medical Center. It's uh, the, the nursing service that then contracts with UVM Medical Center to fill gaps in their nursing schedule. Um, so I, I can explain that much to you. But Are those the, the traveling, need. what they call traveling nurses? Yeah, so um, these would be, let me just see if I can pull up the email on my iPad here. Um, but yeah, these would be traveling nurses or nurse staffing agencies um, that their business is basically when a hospital has a labor shortage, um, they provide temporary staffing to the hospital or to the healthcare facility. Um, yeah that you might contact like uh, um, a staffing company um, to provide temporary administrative support to your company or secretarial support. Um, let me just see if I can find that. So uh, we did do that for uh, contractors for nursing homes, right? Yep. And for and occupational the, therapists and that kind of stuff, but not we, not for nurses. Yeah. So um, yeah. So the the four companies here. Um, so this was forwarded from Wendy Trafton um, over to Stephanie Barrett at uh, JFO, who then passed it on to me. And Wendy Trafton is the uh, staff person at AHS who's been heading up the hazard pay program. Uh, and so she had received email inquiries from Fusion Medical Staffing, which provides mm -hmm. LPN, CNAs, RRTs, and MT, MLTs to skilled nursing facilities and inpatient hospitals. I don't have to, to explain what all the acronyms are because I just don't know. But, um, and then Convergent Services Group, uh, which provides a is a travel nurse staffing agency with employees in Vermont nursing homes and rehab facilities. Um, West staff or we staff uh, also reached out, but they it's not clear that they actually provide nurses. Um, my familiarity with them is they provide administrative um, and office staff. So I don't know if they would even meet the elevated risk. Um, and then Primetime Healthcare, which is another travel nursing staff agency that's provided staff to various uh, facilities and then TLC nursing associations, which provides healthcare staff, including RNs, PCAs, LPNs, et cetera, to long-term care facilities. Um, so, those, those were the, the several inquiries that they'd gotten um, when they contacted us. I don't know if there are others. Um, I also don't know any of the particulars of the work these folks are doing, whether they would even qualify for the elevated risk. Um, but it, it just raises question of whether um, outside of what's proposed in S-353, um, whether there's another sort of frontline medical staff um, or, or long-term care staff uh, group that should be added to this list. Um, and obviously I, I don't have a position on that. I just wanted to make you aware that they'd gotten inquiries. Uh, when I testified in the Senate, I was asked about this. Um, and at that point, we were not aware of any inquiries and that was my testimony in the Senate. So um, now we've, we've received inquiries, so apparently um, these groups are potentially out there. Was there, um, 
has there been a fiscal note prepared to understand what um, additional you know, there, dollars needed? There hasn't. Um, so this might be something that. Um, Hold this, please. Um, yeah, that this might be something that uh, needs needs an additional look if this is a direction that that you want to go in. Um, Wendy Trafton might be able to provide some more background or at least put you in touch with the employers if you wanted to hear from them. Again, I don't I don't know with the janitorial services and the food service providers. Um, the various notes that representatives got described the work they were doing and it seemed pretty clear that they were the group intended to be covered um but i i don't know anything beyond just the list of you know types of nurses and facilities and then the employers that contacted ahs at this point so the the nurses would have to be um, frontline working with patients um with covid yeah um and then the with the way the frontline employees are defined we'll see in a minute um they they may still qualify um so let me just um take a quick quick look here um But um, because they're one of the uh, qualifiers is close contact with um, populations that may have. Um, let me just get the right wording here before I, I say this wrong. Um, so elevated risk is um, so providing in-person services or care to members of the public or clients, um, frequent physical contact or close contact or both with people who may be infected with SARS-CoV-2 but who are not known or suspected COVID-19 patients or in an area, and we're revising this to an area or facility with ongoing community, community transmission of SARS-CoV-2, then the job requires regular close contact with members of the public. So as long as these are nurses who are seeing patients, um, they're likely qualifying for the hazard pay. If they're in an administrative role where they're not seeing patients um, or not closely interfacing with members of the public, then they likely would not qualify. Okay. So it would be traveling nurses that are working in the hospitals, nursing homes, VNAs. Um, yep. And then the other question too is, are they earning $25 an hour or less? Right. Um, now, excuse me. There, um, there was a caveat for VNAs though in there, wasn't there? Mm -hmm. uh, so with the, um, yeah, so we have home health agencies. Um, so if you're employed by a home health agency, um, then, then you're covered. And I think that gets the VNAs. Um, well, they're already covered now. Yeah, so they, they were covered under the original bill. Okay, the yeah. traveling nurses. Yeah, the difference is if you're a traveling nurse sort of staffing company. So um, uh, I'm, th I'm thinking of um, my wife's cousin who's a nurse. Um, and at one point she was, she was considering a position where basically it's a staffing company and they, they move nurses around on three six month rotations yep. Yep. at different areas that are high demand. Yep. Um, you know, and, and so um, that would be a little bit different than like our home health agency nurses there. I mean, this would be traveling, 
traveling no, nurses who are no, multi -state. Home, home health agencies are using traveling nurses also. Right. So if they're, yeah, if they're contracting with an outside traveling nurse group, then they would not be covered unless we put language in that they are. That's right. Okay. Yeah, they have to be employed directly by the okay. covered employer. So we'd have to make those contract groups, the staffing, nurse staffing uh, agencies, um, a covered employer. Okay. Right. Sorry. Lynn? No, thank you. I'm sorry I got here late, but I'm trying to do work for the office. Um, my understanding of the way the hazard pay worked was that if you were a nurse in a nursing home, you were treated differently than a nurse who worked in a hospital. That mm -hmm. the $25 per hour limit didn't apply to the nursing home nurses, but it did apply to the hospital nursing home nurse at the hospital nurses. Most nurses make a whole lot more than $25 an hour. I mean, most RNs. Um, I don't know what LPNs or- um, Oh, nice. Or, you know, you just, you just, they just make a lot of money. Traveling nurses make a lot more. Now, part of that is because, so they really wouldn't be qualified under the way we passed the bill last time. And I don't know if it was um, the nursing homes only got to have some of their personnel covered or all of their nurses covered. Um, but most people in that field make a whole, wouldn't be qualified under the $25 uh, cap. Um, and certainly traveling nurses. I mean, those people, of course, they cost more because what you're doing is you're also paying for their lodging and their, the administrative costs for the, the, the service that provides the nurses. So you might be paying them three times what you pay your nurses that are actually on your staff, but it's not that you pay them, it's that you pay the agency who then pays them, but they still get paid a premium. So I don't know if any of those, I mean, they're gonna be expensive. I mean, I don't know how much money it's gonna to cost to include them, but that's gonna really add to the cost of this. And they don't have to come, they're choosing to come. I mean, lots of people went from different parts of the country to where there were hot spots because they wanted to go there. They don't have to go there. It's not like you're hired by Northwest and that's your job and you have to show up because that's your job. You can choose to come or not to come. So I don't know. Yeah, the, the $25 an hour um, cap, it, the only exceptions to that are, are employees of home health agencies and nursing homes. Yes. Um, and they were, those were separated out because they had nurses who were just above that, that um, line mm -hmm. um and so that they had been separated out for that reason but there was a lot of testimony when this bill went through the first time that most uh rns particularly are are earning well above the five dollar an hour cap yeah and speak for for um lpns who i think earn less but i don't know if they're uh where they are in relation to the cap um i just think they earn less than RNs. Um, so, it, but yeah, it's, this is kind of a, it's a question that came up. I don't know enough about those pay rates, um, but I wanted it, the committee to be aware that it was out there because this is a question that had come up uh, in the past. And previously on the record, I'd said we hadn't heard from any of these groups to say that they needed coverage. Mm -hmm. Now it, uh, we know at least four or five of these staffing agencies have reached out. Again, I don't know if they have, you know, only 5% of their employees or 0% or 50% would meet the wage and exposure qualification requirements. Um, and that that's kind of the big question there. Um, there's also the question of if you're a, uh, um, you know, there, there are other questions too about um, if you were hired in the middle of this, but you were collecting unemployment for a period, you wouldn't be eligible either. So yeah. um, there, are, there are various um, issues that could come into play here. And I just don't know enough about the staffing makeup um, for these groups to answer them. It's, it's something that I wanted to put out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
I mean, as from a functional standpoint, um, I, I mean, given that this has to move along, there's also the possibility that if the committee wants to look into this more, uh, you could move the bill as it is today out and with the caveat that you might just do a small floor amendment addressing this issue. It's a, it would be a fairly discreet ad, but you're right, you would need a fiscal note. You need to get an idea of what this population is. My guess is it would take uh, uh, Joyce and Chloe over at JFO just a couple of days to get the necessary information together to put together a reasonable projection. Um, so it's, it's not something that we could necessarily answer today. Right. Um, when we did the, the home health agencies, nursing homes, I know we're allowing them to go above the cap, but is is there a cap to that, or or is that wide open for them? Um, it uh, was left to the determination of of the agency of human services. I'm not sure how they've um, construed that at this point. Um, so I, I just can't answer that. I think it's a fairly, you're talking about a fairly discreet population yep. of, um, of employees there and they have to meet the exposure requirements. So you won't be capturing, for example, the administrative. Right. Uh, no, but it, but your, I mean, companies. your RNs, <clears throat> RNs do make pretty good dollars. And so I'm just wondering in the guidance that that the agency put out on this, I wonder where they set the set the limit at for them. Um, okay, Stephanie. My question was about the uh, the the staffing agencies, and if in other um, legislation we wanted uh, the. Uh, the businesses to be domiciled in Vermont. And I'm wondering if that's a concern with these staff, staffing agencies, even though the people are living in Vermont, they may not always be residents of Vermont, but they're living in Vermont for that period of time, but their business, but the business hiring them perhaps is not a Vermont company. There, there's no requirement in hazard pay that the business be domiciled in Vermont. And part of the reason for this is it's not a uh, direct assistance to the business, it's to the employees. Um, and so one of the concerns was, for example, um, let's take Dartmouth Hitchcock has operates facilities on the Vermont side of the Connecticut River. Um, one of the concerns was inadvertently excluding frontline employees there just because they work for Dartmouth Hitchcock oh, yeah. and UVM okay. Okay, Medical Center. Now. Okay. Yeah. Charlie. <clears throat> Charlie, you're... Thanks, I was, I was just reading through H965 um, as we passed it to try to tie together what we did for those home health agencies or the companies they contracted with. And it's this long paragraph. Uh, I don't know if it's worth just trying to do that kind of fix to this as well. Uh, I don't know what that looks like. It seems like that we have a construct in order to make that possible uh, within what we did last time, but it would just be um, almost, I mean, we're doing it a little differently for the homeless shelters because it could be almost the same way that we did for the home health, uh, for the nursing home facilities. So I was just looking for that type of information to see what that looks like. Um, so that's uh, one question for Damien. And then Mr. Chair, I have the question uh, in terms of what we know as to what we've uh, allocated by agency human services for hazard pay to date. Uh, and I don't know if the Senate took testimony on that, but it seems like it's either fully subscribed or will soon be oversubscribed, one of those two. Well, I think so, that's why they've added that two and a half million dollars. Right, so um, when this was taken up in the Senate a few weeks ago, um, my understanding was the agency had received a little more than $30 million in applications. Uh, and obviously there's $28 million in the fund. Um, some of the applications were um, 
for either employees or employers who did not qualify. Um, so they, but their expectation was that it was fully subscribed. Um, these three technical changes add employees to that group. Um, and so the two and a half million dollars is the estimate plus a few hundred thousand dollars cushion um, because there are still applications trickling in for the original bill. Um, and so the, the feeling was uh, add a little bit of a cushion um, just to make sure that we don't because um, it is first come first serve to try to make sure that you don't have people who are completely left out. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the two and a half million is estimated to cover the janitorial food service. Um, and then uh, janitorial food service and hotel motel staff who would be covered in the language I just read through plus um, the fourth group is former employees. Um, and this was a drafting error on my part um, because the bill was originally a present tense um, uh, hazard pay program and now it's a retrospective hazard pay program. I didn't change the tense in some of the language. So individuals who worked for a covered employer between mid-March and mid-May and have either since been laid off or switched jobs could not get the benefit because they were no longer a, on their uh, former employer's payroll. Um, so this, the new language here allows employers to identify former employees who might be eligible so that the agency can reach out to them directly um, and uh, help them apply for the grant um, and then pay them, pay them the grant directly assuming they qualify. Um, again, if they collected UI benefits during the eligible period, um, they're immediately disqualified. Uh, and there may be other things, for example, uh, that, that could disqualify them if they come back and say, well, I was working in the office or um, I only worked 20 hours in, in direct contact and the rest of the time was telemedicine, um, something like that. So, um, but that the does, does create a, an avenue to get to those. So those four groups are estimated to cost um, a little more than $2 million. And then that was rounded up to two and a half just to provide a little cushion because the program was already fully subscribed. Okay. Lynn? Yeah, thank you. It looks like we also added um, for staff employed at child care programs to regulated by DCF. Was that in there originally or is that also new? Are you looking at uh, S352 or S353? 352. Should I be looking you're at- You're looking at the child, the, you're looking at section 16? Uh, oh, you're, at, you're looking at section yeah, three. We're, we're not, we're not going to, we're not dealing with that. Okay. We're dealing with the technical corrections piece of it. Once we pass this, it'll get sent to human services and then Human services will deal with the child care issue. Okay. And then, then it goes yeah. to approach. So we have a little time. If we're interested in pursuing this further um, to include those those people that that are contracted but that take care of Vermonters, um, okay. that we have time to yeah. um, have Damien draft the language and also get a fiscal note because. Um, not as important to us as it is to appropriations, um, that would be ready for them to, to make a decision on whether or not to include that. So, so we're not doing 352, is that what you're yes, saying? Yes, we're, do no, we're doing 352, okay. but just these technical corrections, not the child care piece that, that's, yeah, that was an added sense. amendment. Yeah, okay. That was an amendment that was yeah. added. Okay, yeah. janitorial, it's um, food service. Hotel workers. Hotel workers, lodgings, and then former employees. Okay. Right. Yep. And now yep. there's a possibility that we take a look at this this other group of people that that um, possibly should be included. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. So before, that. Yeah. Before we move on, um, is everyone comfortable with with taking a look at this further? We get this out today. Um, we can talk about this more once we see language and once we get uh, 
get something from JFO on um, what the estimate is. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, if you could take a look at that, Damien, prepare language um, so that we can take a look at that um, probably Tuesday. Christy, you have a question? Uh, yeah, just a, a, we're doing clarifications or technical uh, uh, input here on this, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I got an uh, email recently from a uh, funeral home, and within this bill, there is a section for morgue. Does morgue equal funeral home or does funeral home equal morgue? No. Uh, it does not. So you're talking about it does a not. Like within a hospital where they receive the deceased. Uh, uh, yeah. Person. So the, the funeral home and crematory establishments um, would be added by the expansion bill, which is S-353. Um, so these are, these are two separate bills. Um, and the reason they've been separated is S-352. The aim was to capture employees who were meant to be captured in the original bill um, that the House and Senate had agreed on. Um, and so just basically closing loopholes that we had inadvertently left open that left people out. Um, S-353, would restore the employees who were taken out by the house, which included funeral home and crematory establishment workers, um, because of concerns about the federal guidance here. So the federal guidance um, could be read two ways. Uh, one way would be to say that hazard pay, across the board hazard pay is prohibited, um, and it can only be paid to public health, public safety, healthcare, um, your sort of um, frontline medical or first responder um, public health employees. The other way is to read it to say that the limitations on hazard pay only apply to public employees and don't apply to private employers. And as long as there's a COVID related reason, the state can provide grants to private employers or to private individuals. Uh, and since we had this discussion, I came down on the first reading because it was uh, more conservative. Um, and I felt that that was uh, the safer track to go on because of the potential for federal clawback of money that's spent for an impermissible purpose. Since then, uh, Pennsylvania and Louisiana have passed bills that disagree with that opinion that I gave to the legislature in June. Um, and so uh, the Senate had passed as a separate bill so it wouldn't hang up the technical corrections and expansion for the House to consider um, pursuing there. But, but both Pennsylvania and Louisiana have done it. Louisiana's program is a little unique in that it's a tax rebate, so it might skirt the issue by providing the money as a tax rebate rather than as a traditional hazard pay program but Pennsylvania has gone right ahead and done it as a, a hazard pay program that covers uh, for cashiers and that sort of thing. Um, and in that bill 353, you'd get to the private funeral home and crematory employers, whereas morgue is a public, um, public um, employer there, which is why they were included originally. Thank you, Damien. Long explanation, but. Okay. So I think Tuesday we'll get into the nitty gritty of 353. Um, so let's um, look at the rest of the language um, on, on the um, workers that were no longer employed um, when this came out, but were working during the, the time period um, in the bill. All right, I'm just emailing JFO now. Okay. And so um, the next change in the bill um, is I'm going to reshare my screen here. Oops, sorry. I forget that my laptop is not a touch screen. 
<laughs> um, so the this here is one of those um, catching sort of technical issues. Um, we'd had different language throughout these sections here. In some places, we said members of the public or clients. In some places, we said members of the public. And one of the things that uh, we realized was that in a lot of these instances, you're talking about folks who may not be dealing with members of the public, but are dealing with patients or residents or that sort of thing. Um, so that's all this is here is just cleaning up the language so that we're not inadvertently excluding um, someone. And then um, the next here is just to cover the janitorial staff. Um, we realized that the original cleaning language um, required uh, that the individual be cleaning premises that are uh, that's used by individuals who are known or suspected to have COVID-19. Um, but a lot of janitorial staff, particularly in nursing homes, are cleaning areas that are regularly used by individuals who could be infected, but you don't know. And the whole point of putting themselves at that risk is to prevent a breakout or an outbreak in the in the nursing home where you have a high risk population. Uh, and so these individuals uh, would be included here because they're taking the risk uh, in high traffic areas in order to protect our most vulnerable populations here. Um, the next clarifications here, the ongoing community transmission. Uh, this is kind of an interesting section here. Vermont was an area with ongoing community transmission for roughly a month of the two month period. Um, but we also had facilities with ongoing community transmission of the virus. Uh, and we wanted to make sure we weren't inadvertently excluding people who are working in those facilities um, from uh, the hazard pay um, in case they didn't work because the the whole considering the state as an area of ongoing community transmission uh, because it was only for a limited period of time there there were just concerns here that um, about inadvertently excluding folks although they would probably qualify under the close contact provisions elsewhere um, so but again this is uh, as I like to say belts and suspenders and another belt or suspenders <laughs> We're just really trying to make sure they're covered. Um, the next piece here is changing the eligible employee definition of the past tense. This is the drafting error that I mentioned to you earlier where I'd left everything in the present tense. Um, and so when these questions came up uh, and I looked at the law with the folks from AHS, I said, you're right, it says present tense. So former employees aren't covered. The other issue for former employees um, as this committee will be um, uh, very aware is the whole issue of once someone is no longer your employee, they're no longer on your payroll. Um, and to bring them back on payroll would be a burden. So there's a whole separate process created for that um, so that employers who want to give credit to their former employees can identify those employees to the agency, then the agency will reach out and deal with the grant directly with that employee. Um, are there any questions about this? I, I guess why why does that just apply to former employees? Um, Wouldn't it apply to all employees? It, it applies to both current and former. The change allows it to apply to former. Okay, but yeah, so uh, these what, these are. The current employees, because the, the eligible period is mid-March to mid-May. Right. Um, so in some cases, those employees have stayed on um, all the way through. In other cases, those employees may have left for a different job after the period ended, right. um, or maybe even during the period, but they worked the required number of hours to be eligible. Um, so, um, Examples could be uh, someone who um, was working as a, a nurse in a healthcare facility, 
but moved back home so that they could uh, be closer to their parents um, during the crisis here or something like that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I understand that. Uh, I'm just trying to understand why if, if the agency felt that they could pay people that are still working for the same company, why do they feel they can't pay people that used to work for them? Because I, you know, we're talking about present tense and past tense. So even when this passed, it wasn't, it was already in the past. It should have been past tense. So why, yes. why aren't the other ones ineligible then? You know, the ones that have already been paid? Yeah, so the ones who have already been paid are folks who were working during the eligible period. Yeah. Um, and so weren't the other ones. Yeah. So weren't the ones that weren't working and that aren't working for them presently. But because of the language I'm going to highlight here, um, so it said, is employed by a covered employer that has applied for a grant. And so the agency interpreted the language literally, which is what we asked them to do. Um, and they said, well, we're... Is so, so, okay, so the, it's a so they basically said, Okay, I get it. It's a continuous... Yeah, you worked the hours during the eligible period, but you have to be currently employed. That's what the legislature told us. And that was my mistake when we I were... I got it, okay. Last minute as I forgot to change the tense. Yep. Um, so this would make those employees who have left eligible. Okay. Zach, uh, Zach has a question uh, yeah um damien Definitely. is there is there a mechanism for the employee the employee to uh, the former employee to um to submit an application you know i'm uh, just I, I worry about some employers being preoccupied or uh, you know not having enough time to really be thinking about these previous employees um or in the case of uh, who knows uh maybe uh an employer fired a previous employee and and doesn't like them and doesn't want to submit the paperwork for them is there is there a mechanism for the individual to apply or does that make uh, sense there there is not um and part of the concern about that was um whether administratively the agency could handle an influx of individual applications hmm. rather than, and then having to do the follow up with employers rather than having employers say, these are the employees who qualified. And all along that's been kind of the, the process here is employers apply and you are always at risk that your employer is going to decide you don't meet the criteria um, or um, this happened in Pennsylvania. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the chain, giant supermarkets just decided not to participate. Um, so all of their employees, they're the largest supermarket chain in Pennsylvania. Uh, all of their employees were left out of the hazard pay program because they just decided not to apply. Um, and that's been an, a, a potential risk here all along, but administratively, um, the the administrative costs were uh, diminished significantly um, by switching over to this sort of employer application here where the employer initially identifies people and then it's processed that way. So, um, but yes, there are potentially people whose employers will just choose not to apply or choose not to do it for former employees or something like that. So there is a risk Okay, thank you. Yep. Stephanie? I'll follow up on the same topic. So, uh, the former, so if an employee was uh, employed during that, during the period, the necessary period, no longer with that organization, they would contact their former employer to make sure that they would be getting receiving the hazard pay. That'd be their only that'd be the only mechanism for them to get. Yep, they could they could contact their former employer to say, could you could you please submit the uh, the notice to the agency? The agency is also required to reach out to any employer that's already applied to say, please let us know if there are any former employees who may also be eligible. You don't have to confirm that they meet all of the eligibility. You just have to confirm that they worked for you. Yeah. 
covered job or an eligible job for the requisite number of hours. And then we'll reach out to them directly and do all of the, you know, the social security number and the other application piece at that point. Um, so it, it becomes kind of a two-step process where they say, can you let us know if there are any former employees that we should reach out to and give us um, their contact information? Then the agency reaches out and if the former employee follows up, they can apply for the grant at that point. So basically the agency says, you may be eligible, here's how to apply. And then they'll review the applications at that point. Okay, thank you. I was concerned that the former employee would have to submit their own application directly to the agency. And create yeah, the so, credit. yeah, they will have to apply. Ultimately, they'll have to submit an application, but the, the agency is going to reach out to the former employers to say, can you identify these people so we can get in touch with them? Thanks. Yeah, Lynn? Yeah, thank you. When you talk about administrative uh, burden. Mm -hmm. um, how does a, how do, this creates a huge issue for an, an employer who someone's moved on, they're no longer an employee. Um, I'm going to guess this has to come out of your payroll just like it normally would. No? Do they send them? Oh. They send the grant to the employer and then the employer so, passes it yeah. on to the employee. So, yeah, there's, I think that's further on in the, in, the, in the language. It is. It's actually the next thing we're going to get to. Okay, I'll hold. Thanks. So, I, yeah, I will answer that. Um, so one um, piece that we took out here is the restriction on eligible employees um, do not include an independent contractor or self-employed individual. Um, and we've changed the um, change that so it's the number of hours um, including work performed as an independent contractor or sole proprietor. Um, so the, the reason for that was um, that there was concern that you have individuals who are working two jobs. Um, on one, they're an independent contractor, on the other, they're employed. And uh, this was creating some confusion about whether those individuals, or for example, if they left their job and are now working as an independent contractor, but they'd previously qualified, whether they would be excluded from this program. And so this is just clarifying that we are not um, providing hazard pay for work performed as an independent contractor, but that if you, um, but you're not restricted from receiving the grant if you have a second job as an independent contractor. Um, are there questions on that clarification? Okay, so the, the next thing gets to um, what we were just um, talking about. This first piece is just language um, that allows an individual who um, is eligible to receive a grant directly from the program, and these would be your former employees, are gonna be paid directly by the agency um, as if they're receiving, or they'll basically be receiving a grant from the state of Vermont. Um, and so these individuals have the option to elect not to receive the hazard pay. Um, the reason for this has to deal with the benefits cliff. Um, there are certain instances where individuals may want to decline the hazard pay because whatever benefits program they're on may not disregard it. In a lot of instances, um, this income, because it comes in a single lump sum, is disregarded for purposes of benefits programs. And we've also got language in the original bill that directs the state to the extent permitted by federal law to disregard this income for purposes of determining eligibility. But still, people are, this is basically saying you're not required to accept the grant, um, although it's outside of a real extreme benefits cliff scenario. It's hard to imagine any instance where someone would not want to accept the grant. Um, so. Damien, th th yeah. this is 
this is just for the people that were employed during the period yes. and then became so it, it puts giving, them on the same footing as a current employee who can decline a grant but in this case uh, the employer the former employer is providing name and address the agency is following up and asking them to file an application why would they have to elect not to receive if they're going to file the application aren't isn't it at that point that they're making a determination whether or not to accept it they're not they're not automatically uh, automatically being given the grant um yeah um that's a good point um as i'm reading this it says by providing notice but that the providing notice language dates back to when this grant was op automatic and you had to affirmatively turn it down right um so yeah this i'm trying to think whether you even need to allow them to elect not to receive it um yeah, because if they're if they're going to fill out an application, then they're electing to receive it. If they don't want to receive yeah. it, they don't fill out the application. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This you're exactly right. This language can come out. Um, good catch. Um, so that I guess would be the committee amendment for Tuesday um or i can do that for today too um either today or we'll do it um, when it gets to the floor okay yeah i mean i can the the language I'm trying to think how quickly i could turn this around um because yeah i just strike out this subdivision and then i think what we'll do i original mean original language it it, it it it's probably likely that we will make the change for the contracted nurses. Um, and I think there's a need to get this out today so it can get to human services and then approves. Mm -hmm. So I think anything that we need to change, we can make an amendment on the floor after. Okay. I will get this amendment going though. Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, the next piece here this gets now we're getting to representative um what i was just discussing with representative dickinson and so a covered employer may identify potentially eligible employees who are no longer employed by providing their name mailing address and any other information required by the secretary and then the program shall provide the individuals with notice of their potential eligibility and information regarding how to apply for a grant. Um, and then subdivision J here, or subsection J, um, basically said um, they have to says they have to provide them with notice of how that they may be eligible to obtain a grant and information regarding how to apply. Um, and the notice and information shall be sent to the address provided by the former employer. Um, <clears throat> moved hopefully they've provided a forwarding address but you'll notice this doesn't require the state to track them down just to at minimum provide notice um, to the address provided um, so um, the notice uh, sent shall inform them that they may elect to decline the grant and provide them with information regarding how to do so we could just change that to uh, um, shall inform the individual that he or she is not required to uh, apply for a grant or even just delete that altogether since application. Um, there, was there language um, prior, prior to this that uh, in, the, in the original that talked about um, notifying the employee that they, they don't have to accept the grant, but was there language that talked about the benefits cliff or anything? There, there wasn't. Uh, well, in the original, in the original, there was language that basically said that for purposes of determining eligibility for benefits, to the extent allowable, the state would disregard this, 
this grant amount. Yeah, um, but I but I mean, we did we provide was was notice needed to be provided to the employee um, to to check whether or not they could lose benefits because they accept the grant. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Um, so the and the the problem for that is. Um, In the especially for these former employees, you may not have their social security number and so forth. And then for current employees, the employer may not know that they're receiving benefits. Right. Um, so in both cases, it's basically up to the employee to know. Okay. Um, and, you, and you said previously, I think a little while ago, that it's unlikely that that they would um, lose benefits because of this. Yeah, so for some of the programs, the benefits programs, a single lump sum payment like this uh, isn't going to disqualify you anyway. And then we added in language that um, says for the, uh, to the extent permitted by federal law, hazard pay provided to an eligible employee through a grant through the program shall not be considered as earned income, unearned income, or a resource for the purpose of any public benefit program um, or make hazard pay recipients ineligible for any public benefit programs, including Vermont Medicaid. Um, and so we're basically saying to the extent that we can uh, disregard this one-time benefit, okay. federal regulations, we're going to do so. Okay. Um, and so here you're suggesting we just make a few changes in the, in the wording? Yeah, I think at this point, um, you could just inform the individual that he or she is not required to uh, so, for a grant. But he or she are not required to file an application for the grant or yeah, not accept the grant. Or, I, I mean, it, once they file the application, they're basically saying they're accepting it. Right, because at that point, if you're deemed eligible, there you're going to get a check from the state. Right. Um, so um, I guess you can, you know, what the the thought is is they just I don't know how to word it, but they're not required to file an application. Yeah. For the grant. If they want the grant, they file an application. If you don't want it, you don't have to file it. Yep. Um, yeah, I think we just re strike from a elect to decline through the end of the sentence and replace that with um, uh, um, is not required to file an application for the grant. Okay. Yeah, and just kind of make clear that you know they they can choose whether or not to take this money um, I think in most instances people will take it but there may be circumstances where this would change change something for them they don't want to lose a particular benefit um, due to the additional income and this will be 1099 income um, so it's going to be on a t uh, reported for purposes of taxation on a 1099 uh, miscellaneous so, um, and then the grant would come directly from the program. So Representative Dickinson, this kind of goes to your question earlier, because these are former employees, um, in order to avoid the issue where employers are not identifying former employees because they're afraid of the additional administrative cost of putting them back on payroll, reporting taxes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, reestablishing direct deposit, whatever it is. Um, they're just providing contact information. The state pays them the grant check and then sends them a 1099 miscellaneous and the individuals will have to report it on their taxes and pay any applicable taxes uh, on that amount um, when they file their taxes next year. Um, and then 
Um, they have to be provided with notice that it may be subject to income tax to kind of give them the heads up that they may want to set aside um, a portion of that money. Um, and then the last piece here is because we'll now be collecting social security numbers, um, any personally identifiable uh, information um, collected by the program, any entity of state government performing a function or any entity that the secretary has contracted with um, has to be kept confidential. And then it, it's exempt from the Public Records Act. So that's, that's pretty standard language there um, that covers our bases. Um, are there questions on that? Okay, the last piece here, section two, just requires the program to send notice to covered employers um, that it may identify potentially eligible employees who were no longer employed by the employer at the time it submitted its initial application and provide information regarding how to identify the eligible employees to the program. Um, and then shall provide and for the third time, we're saying the program has to provide those individuals with notice of their potential eligibility. So, and then, oh, go ahead. Damien, uh, just the difference in wording, uh, not difference in wording, but it's you're consistently, the covered employer may identify potential eligible employees. Uh, and that's also above. Um, so it's not a requirement that they identify eligible employees, correct? That's correct. Um, so there's to Zach's really... point before, uh, what happens if an employer decides not to and that, um, that employee is left out? Uh, there's no recourse for that employee uh, in the way the, the bill exists at this point. In the same way that if you work in a covered, potentially covered job now and your employer decides not to apply, there's no recourse for you. There's no way for you to get that grant if your employer decided not to apply for it. It would, it would um, seem to make sense that if the employer is applying for anybody to receive hazard pay that they have to identify both those who are currently employed and those who are formerly employed. Mm -hmm. So that, that could be a change that the House puts in. Um, the Senate discussed uh, that to some extent. Um, one of the concerns that was raised in the Senate um, and part of the, re and this was part of the discussion that ended up with the word may being left in. And again, I'm not taking a position on this. Um, this is just some of the discussion that I remember on this were concerns about, for example, someone who'd been terminated for cause um, during the, uh, either during the benefits period or afterwards, but was otherwise eligible because they'd been working in uh, the position and so forth, but they were terminated for misconduct. Um, the employers may not want to apply for them. Um, and so that, that was, one of the potential issues that was just raised, uh, raised mm -hmm. and when the Senate considered this and, and elected to leave it as a may. Um, That's awfully petty. <laughs> it, I'm sorry, you know, but that, you know, if they're applying, for, I mean, I, I, I won't make a, I mean, I understand we've got to get this thing out and all of that. I just want to make a point that, <sighs> You know, if you have an employee and you, you're applying for your current employees and you did terminate someone for cause for whatever reason, to do further punish the employee, the former employees, I think just petty. I just, I'll just leave that at that as, a, as an editorial comment. I'm not going to do anything about it, but I just, um, maybe that's how the Senate views employees, I'm just saying. Well, I, I, I think what Damien was talking about was um, when you when you let somebody go for cause, that means that they've done something that they shouldn't have done, like steal right. from you, or yeah. it's it's not just you know 
somebody quit and that's it. There's, there's generally a, a good cause. So I, I can see both sides of it. I, that's why that's why Mr. Chair, I'm not doing anything about it. I can see the other side too. I just wanted to make a point. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be in quiet a, now. In an at will state though, you could let somebody go without cause. Right. Yeah. Right. You so can let last... someone go for good cause, bad cause, or no cause. No yeah. cause. So just seems hey. like if, if they if they want it, if an employer wants to play in the game, then they should be covering all the people who are employed during that hazard period. I mean, if we're really trying to thank the people, which is what this really amounts to, thank the people who put money in their pocket for subjecting themselves or willingly working in a role that exposes them to COVID-19, then those employers should be forced to include both those who are still employed and those who were employed during that period. Thank you, Representative Kimball. Well, oh, and, and I wonder if there's a, could there be a discrimination issue with that? Uh, that could be filed against the employer for discriminating against a, a former employee and not providing their name when they did provide it for all their other employees? Uh, it, you know, it, that's a great question. I think it would be a novel, um, novel uh, legal issue. Certainly it's conceivable that um, that could be part of a discrimination suit, um, an alleged harm that occurred in a discrimination suit. You know, I raised, I filed a complaint about sexual harassment. I was terminated because of that. And then even though I'd worked the required number of hours, um, you also didn't identify me for hazard pay, um, you know. So it could be a retaliatory um, termination and then non-identification. But in that case, the individual, assuming that, and this gets to a, a much bigger question of um, sexual harassment, a particularly bad one because it's a very high standard to prove, um, and it's very difficult to prove in court. Um, but assuming the individual could could prove it in court, they have a remedy that way um, where they can get damages. Um, but yeah, I mean that that requires individuals to um, you know be able to file a successful lawsuit for discrimination, um, which in and of itself, depending on the circumstances, is often extremely challenging. Uh, and a long drawn out process. So yes, there are, are instances that I can think of where it would uh, potentially be part of the damages consideration and an example of retaliatory conduct um, or discriminatory conduct, but. Uh, well, I just wonder if it sets up the state making it the state look bad um, where, uh, you know, individuals that had worked for someone, they they declined to enter their name, although they did with all their other employees and the state doesn't have a remedy for it. I, I just yeah. think it could give the program a bad name too. Yeah, I think in the instant, <clears throat> um, you know, particularly with, um, particularly with, uh, a uh, current employee. Um, yeah, if you've got disparate treatment between someone who's in a protected category and someone who is not, I think there's uh, at least a colorable discrimination claim. Um, you know, so if, if for example, um, you, you filed a claim for all of your employees who uh, practiced a certain religion, but not for the one employee who didn't. Um, there you've got a colorable claim of discrimination on the basis of religion. Same thing if, if you filed it for all, uh, for all the people who were, 
you know, born in the United States, but you didn't file it for the people who are born in Canada or something like that. Um, the, there's a, that's a, a clear disparate treatment argument. Um, it gets a little dicier if the, uh, if you've got an instance where the employer alleges that they fired you for cause, um, and you're alleging that the cause was basically um, uh, a made up cause to cover up the fact that you'd been, you'd raised a complaint about uh, discrimination or um, an OSHA violation or something like that, that was occurring in the workplace and they were doing this as retaliation and then to further the retaliation, they they also didn't include you in the list of people who are qualified. So if they filed some, if they fired you for cause, it would have to be after the after the period, because if they fired you during the period, you wouldn't be eligible. Is that correct? Not necessarily, um, because the way it's worded now. Um, so imagine you work forty hours a week in a. A potentially eligible position. Um, within two weeks of work, you'd meet the minimum working eligibility requirements, uh, assuming that all of those hours of work are, are in the risk. Um, and it's an eight week period or a nine week period. So um, you, you could potentially be fired halfway through the period or, or even you know, three weeks into the period and still have met the minimum to qualify for the $1,200 grant. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely potential instances here where there are former employees who um, could have fired for this reason. It, it's really impossible for me to say how likely it is that we're going to find those individuals. Um, I think another is just that you have an employer who says, I'm going to file for my current employees because they stayed with me, but I'm not going to file for my former employees because they didn't. Um, you know, if, if employees left for greener pastures or something like that, um, you, okay. you also potentially run into that. The other thing you run into is, um, and this, this is just in the requirements of the program altogether, if someone quit partway through because they, for a valid UI COVID related quit reason, they don't qualify for this because they would qualify for the federal pandemic unemployment compensation. Right. At that point though, their employer still identifies them as potentially eligible, but then in the application, they'll probably have to check a box that says, did you accept unemployment benefits during that window right so there if, and if you get fired you're not eligible for unemployment benefits okay right if you've been um yeah if you were fired for gross misconduct and your employer reports it you're ineligible for unemployment anyway but you could have collected pandemic unemployment assistance um so okay although zach, zach has a question yeah well it was i guess um kind of Going back to Charlie's question about the may versus the shall, and I'm not really can even if somebody was fired for just cause, it doesn't feel like that should be a reason that they don't actually receive pand uh, this uh, hazard pay. They still obviously risk their, you know, they're risking something. So I'm trying to find a good reason why a company wouldn't um, be required to do this if they had employees that were working. And it feels like an employ an employer would want to do this anyways. But you did mention that uh, grocery store chain in Pennsylvania, um, Damien. Do you know why they decided they didn't want to apply for this hazard pay? I don't. Um, I I know. I just know that they were named um, in one of the news reports on the Pennsylvania program, which was rapidly oversubscribed. Um, and so, I mean, to to put it in context. This is a, a $30 million program for Vermont. Pennsylvania put aside $50 million for the entire state of Pennsylvania. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of the, and they theirs was available to a broader cross-section of employers. Um, so I don't know if 
uh, the grocery store chain felt that it was too much of an administrative burden um, or that they were unlikely to get a meaningful benefit out of it or, or what it was, but it was, they were singled out because they were one of the biggest employers that was eligible. Um, and the, it was public knowledge at that point that they had chosen not to apply um, presumably because their employees had, had made that public um, and you could confirm that with the list of applicants from the state. Um, and so it, it just stood out to whoever that reporter was. So they said, you know, several, several large employers have chosen not to apply, including this grocery store chain. Um, well, that's, re that's really interesting. I you know, I, I think uh, maybe maybe there's an opportunity for a, a floor amendment for this in the future, um, if if you think so. But it, it does feel like I don't I don't see a real good reason. I mean, may, maybe that was the case for Pennsylvania. It doesn't seem like it would apply for us. I think our benefits are probably better, but it might might be worth exploring either turning it into a shall or coming up with some sort of mechanism that allows for the individual to apply. Although I do understand that that creates a lot of additional work for the agency of human resources so I, or services. So I, I wonder if there's a less burdensome uh, track to, to, to allow for individuals to apply. Um, yeah, th and that's, that's a good question. You yeah. have to talk to the agency yeah. about kind of the burden. Um, so we've got nine minutes to the floor. That means we've got about seven minutes to move this bill. Um, so I think let's think about this, um, at least turning the, the may into a shall for businesses that have applied. Um, so let, we'll, we'll see the language from Damien um, on Tuesday, and then we'll make a decision of whether or not to make that change also. Um, so that'll be in our floor amendment. Um, at this point, is there anything else we need to know, Damien? Oh, excuse me, there is not. Um, okay. So, so we have all the information. Yeah. Um, is there any more questions for Damien or any anyone uh, need any more clarifications? Okay, Stephanie, um, got paperwork ready? Okay, so uh, at this point, I would um, I would uh, entertain a motion to report favorably on S three fifty two. I'll move that. I'll, I'll second, second it. <laughs> no, whichever. Yeah, whatever. Okay, uh, Representative Sullivan moves, and it's seconded by Representative Watson to um, report favorably on S three fifty two. Is there any further discussions? If not, the clerk can call the roll. Representative Bancroft? Yes. Representative Bach? Yes. Representative Carroll? Yes. Representative Dickinson? Um, Representative Jerome, yes. Representative Kimball? Yes. Representative Marcotte? Yes. Representative Morris? Yes. Representative O'Sullivan? Yes. Representative Tolino? Yes. And Representative Watson? Yes. Is Rep Dickinson not back on? Okay. Yeah, I just have one question. Um, what do we do? I've been I've been trying to do two things at once here. Um, we're we're voting on the bill as it stands right now. Okay. What does that do with the contracted nurses? Nothing because we have that that'll be an amendment. Okay. All right. Well, I'll vote yes on the whatever the changes are. Okay. Representative Dickinson's yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So it looks like an eleven zero. Um, who would like to report? I've never heard so much silence in my life. <laughs> okay. 
anyone? Who wants to do it? I would nominate Representative Bach, but I don't want to subject him this to him, his first bill. Uh, <laughs> I, I would volunteer for it, provided that we move forward with that amendment. That'd be great. We move forward with, an, with those amendments? Well, I'm, I'm assuming we will. I'm hoping we will anyway, but uh, okay. And I'll be right. happy to. Okay. So what's the process now, Damien? Um, it's got to, we got to get it to the floor so it can go, it can move. So does Charlie um, let the clerk know? Um, yeah, I think you let the clerk know that you voted it out. Um, don't have a clean copy yet, right? No, we don't, but you've, you've, um, I think at the moment you voted um, to report favorably on the, the Senate proposal. Right. Um, without further proposal of amendment. And then the, the floor amendment that we're going to look at next Tuesday will be, it won't be a committee report. It'll be an individual amendment. So uh, whatever you vote out as a committee um, can be sponsored by as many members of the committee as want to sign on to it. Yeah. But does the clerk need the clean copy now in order for child? Um, I think you, that's a great question for the clerk. Okay, uh, Charlie, why don't you um, just give, give the clerk's office a call, tell them we just voted it out, but it is going to have to move to human services and then to approves. Um, so just tell them a clean copy is coming. It's the drafters are backed up and I'm sure they'll, they can, they'll let you know what to do. Yes, as soon as we get that out, I'll, um, I'll send an email to uh, you, Mr. Chair, and to Charlie, um, just to let you know that it's available and that you can provide the clean copy of the clerk's office, which they should have too. Okay. So, so then I'll okay. scan this and get this to the clerk's office as well. I'm sorry? I'll get, I'll get this um, doc, the uh, record of action to the clerk's office as okay. well. Okay, okay, yep, great. Okay, super. Um, so we're on the floor in three minutes. Um, so thank you, committee. Um, Damien, thank you. Um, You're welcome. Good, good work this afternoon. We'll finish this up Tuesday, and then we'll start working on uh, two, the 353, um, which would be okay. probably a little more intense. So thank you again, um, and have a good weekend, everyone. We'll see you on the floor in a couple minutes. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.